Flesh. You will be travelling through time with Sarah Morris, the Tudor Travel Guide, uncovering the stories behind some of the most amazing Tudor locations and objects in the UK. Because when you visit a Tudor building, it is only time and not space which separates you from the past. And now over to your host, Sarah Morris. Hello, it's Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide here. Welcome to this month's episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. This is just a note to say that if you are hearing this, then you are not currently part of my membership programme and will only be hearing the first part of each show. In order to access full episodes of the Tudor History and Travel Show, you will need to become a member of my membership site, The Ultimate Guide to Exploring Tudor England, via the link in the description associated with this podcast. Well, in a moment, I will be introducing the star of today's podcast. But first, just a very quick interlude to let those of you know who are itching to get on the road and perhaps come and tour with me in person that we have at Simply Tudor Tours just very recently launched our flagship tour, The Rise and Fall of Anne Boleyn for September 2025. In fact, it is the 8th to the 14th of September 2025. Now, we had an amazing time this year on tour. We had such incredible fun. What a wonderful group of people. And it was a real pleasure to share the story of the rise and fall of Anne Boleyn through the places that were so important to her and which forms such a wonderful backdrop to those dramatic events that crashed through her life. Well, if you are interested, you can check out all the details on the Simply Tudor Tours website. And the link to that will be in the description, but it is simply www.simplytudortours.com. And from the homepage, you will be able to search on our tours and indeed this specific tour. We also have another tour which will be launching very shortly for 2026. That is 1502, the year that shook the Tudor throne when we will be going in the footsteps of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. So you might want to keep your eyes out for that. And then finally, our tour in May next year, which begins on the 19th of May for the week, uh, Anne and Elizabeth, mother, daughter, traitors, queens, uh, only has three places left. So if you are thinking about where do I want to go next year and you're itching to see some fabulous Tudor sites and have a great time, you might want to check that out as well. Okay, well, I'm not going to say any more about the tours. As I say, the link will be in the description. But for now, I want to turn our attention to today's star of the show. Oh, wow, what a star. Now, I have to admit that a little over a year ago, I don't think I'd ever heard of this place. And then one day it popped up on my Instagram feed and I was like, where is this? I've never been. I need to know more. Well, the place in question is the glorious Pitchford Hall, which is a timber framed Elizabethan building, which still stands in pretty much all its glory. Although it's had quite a turbulent history, times where it has flourished and sadly fallen into neglect. Now, today's guide is in fact the owner of Pitchford Hall, James Nason. And he and his family have done an exceptional job to save Pitchford from complete ruin. I think it's fair to say that they have been working extremely hard over the last 10 years to bring Pitchford Hall back to its former glory. Now, you're going to hear all about the history of the hall and the family's efforts to preserve it in this podcast. And although it's not generally open to the public, there are special events held throughout the year which would allow you to come and see 
Pitchford for yourself. And for that reason, and because it is one of England's finest timber-framed houses, I had to include it on an episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. Okay, well, I don't think there's anything more to say. We need to get straight on over there and meet up with the owner, James, who, as I said, will be our guide for today. Good morning, dear listeners. And I say good morning because it is a beautiful, sunny summer's morning here in Shropshire. And oh, wow, I am standing outside one of the most magnificent and impressive timber framed or half timber framed houses I think I've ever seen. It is Pitchford Hall in Shropshire and we are lucky because we have been invited for an exclusive private tour of the hall and this particular place has a fascinating story not only in terms of its Tudor history but actually also its very recent history because, as you will hear from its owner, James Nason, who we're going to meet just in a moment, this particular hall was in a terrible and parlous state of repair until the family repurchased it relatively recently and are trying to bring Pitchford Hall back to life. So I am delighted to be able to introduce you to this building. And remember, dear listeners, that as ever, there will be a show notes page associated with this podcast and we'll make sure that we put lots of pictures in there so that you can see just what we are talking about. Okay well I think without further ado I need to make my way across the gravel courtyard. Oh and by the way I have my lovely four-legged friend here with me today. Hello River. River's my uh, Eurasia and she is accompanying Chris and I on this podcast recording. So if you hear her whimpering in the background, that's my dog. Anyway, together we are going to explore the hall and I'm just making my way up a stone flight of stairs to this rather grand wooden door. Let's see if James can answer for us. Hi oh, Sarah. Hello James. Hello. Welcome hello. to uh, welcome to Pitchford. Pitchford oh, Hall. Oh, you're most. Yes. And thanks for knocking loud because we haven't got a doorbell. I'm afraid it's oh. another a restoration oh, project that's, at, that's at, at some uh, at some point. Come come into the come into the great hall. Thank you so much. So we just make our way up a couple of flights of uh, just a small few stairs here. Wow! Into a this is the great hall, the original hall of the of the building. Yeah, th- this is the this is the great hall. I mean, I'll, I'll explain. When we go outside, the, the, the Great Hall has probably moved around uh, over the over the years at Pitchford, and and you know what what we see today is that obviously we're in a Tudor building, but in a sense this is a Victorian interpretation right. of what they thought a Tudor building uh, or a Tudor Great Hall should should look uh-huh. like. So you, you'll see at Pitchford, there's you know it has changed over the over the over the ages. Every generation has had a go at adding, you know, bits and pieces to the to the hall. And um, every room has probably had a slightly different use over, over the time. But I'll, I'll give you a sense of okay. how it all kind of fits together. OK, well, we're going to sort of um, start to explore the history. And I was just mentioning outside to, to the listeners how your family has repurchased the hall recently to bring life back into it and hopefully engage as many different as many different people as possible with the future of the hall. But before we do all that, perhaps you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to own the hall. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it, it all gets a bit emotional in, in, a, in a sense because I first came to Pitchford in 1991, um, with my girlfriend at the time, who, who's now my wife, we're at university together at Bristol University. And I remember turning up and being absolutely blown away by the house. I don't think we went to sleep that nice night. We were just exploring, like, you know, I hope, yeah. I hope you will, Sarah, okay. um, over the next few, few hours. And then kind of tragedy struck in the, a year later, I remember her, Rowena, coming up to me and saying, my parents have just told me that we have to sell this house. Huge, huge shock, but it, because it had been her home since um, 
1972. Mm-hmm. And she was, it, it was in um, room A at the time. We've got a lot of alphabetical rooms okay. at Pitchford. And, you know, she was obviously in floods of, floods of tears. Oh. And the, you know, it's, it's true, the house was sold. It was offered to the National Trust first, but but it didn't work out. It was then offered to English Heritage. It didn't it didn't work out. So then it was sold, and all the contents were sold in a Christie's auction. And you know, a, a few months later, Rowena's family left, and we made a kind of solemn oath to ourselves that at some point, and we were only you know twenty year olds oh. at, at this at this time, <laughs> at some point in our lives, we would try and you know bring. Pitchford Hall back into the Pitchford estate. Mm. And um, we didn't know at that time that we'd have such a restoration task on our hands. But for the for the 25 years before we managed to reunite the hall with the estate, it, it, no one no one lived here. Right. No one stayed a night here. It went derelict. It was on the heritage risk register. English heritage were getting you know, very concerned about it. And Fortunately, we managed to buy it back in, in 2016. Right. Um, and ever since then, you know, we've been trying to get paintings back, furniture back, life back. And, it, you know, it's great you're visiting today because it's good to see kind of life and interest at Pitchford. Um, and and to, to restore the house. And you'll see, you know, some of the some of the work we're doing in terms of the lime plaster and the lime wash uh, work we're doing and, and some of the oak, oak framing work. So it's a huge, huge task. Um, but, you know, we make progress every year. Yeah. And there's visible progress. And, yeah. you know, we like people visiting and, and, and seeing the progress we're making in terms of this restoration story. And it's a restoration story of the house. It's a restoration story of the contents. It's a restoration story of the of the gardens and grounds, and also hopefully research. You know, hopefully we'll encourage people to research. You know, because a lot you'll ask me lots of questions today, which I'm afraid I won't know the answer to <laughs> because no one's researched this house okay. for you know, 25, 30, 30 years. Okay, wow, wonderful. So we're going to see some of this uh, restoration of the house in progress, and I'd love to certainly circle back towards the end because I think the story of bringing the contents back into the house is really interesting as well. But I'm in your hands, James. So where should we start our tour? Well, so when I normally do guided tours, I start. We we have lots of brilliant volunteers. And each volunteer starts at a, a different part in the hall so we don't kind of clash our, our, our groups. But I want to take you out onto you know, what we call the South Lawn. And you'll really get a sense of the... This is probably the most obviously Tudor <laughs> part of the house. It's amazing. And, you know, there, there are lots of things I, I want to show you here. But if we, if in, in a sense walk yourself back to 1549 and what we think we had here where, where the west wing is mm. is probably you know the great hall that you talked about when, when we when we first started and we think this building was probably by that time quite a derelict great hall and then the Otley family at the time had probably amassed quite a lot of wealth through the kind of North Wales, Shropshire so can wall I just, trade. Can I interrupt? Yeah, so, yeah, so, the, so the Otley family so, were the Tudor owners or the, the people who came along yes. and created the Tudor house here at Pitchford. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it was, a, it was a man called Adam Otley. And the Otley family bought the estate in 1473. And, and you know, we think, and this is why we need more research at, at Pitchford, really. We think... This was, you know, Great Hall, but but past its kind of sell by date in, in in a sense. So can I just put, can I just, maybe just let's describe for the listeners what we're we're seeing in totality because it's a it's it's kind of a U shaped uh, from this angle, isn't yes. it, on the south side? So we've got the central range in front of us, and then projecting out on either side, we've got what a western and east wing. You're, you're is, that, is, absolutely is that right? right? Absolutely right. Um, I just guessed that because you said the west side. So <laughs> I, I kind of guessed that must have been the east. <laughs> Uh, so, so, and in it, you describe it as a part timber frame building. So it's got stone base with the kind of the typical timber frame wattle and daub. Um, 
beautiful, isn't it? The, the arrangement of the wood just makes it look so pretty. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's got it's got, it's got a red sandstone base. I mean, Pitchford has got almost everything in it. You know, if you once you start kind of poking around in terms of the restoration work, you'll find Waffle and Daub. You'll find last, you'll obviously find lime plaster, lime wash. You'll find bricks in, in between some of the uh, half timbering at some point. Um, James Pitchford, the name, is there, is there a particular reason why it's called that? Yes, there is. And it, it's, it's, you know, I can actually show you. Yeah, go we're, on. We're, about, we're about four or five metres away <laughs> from, you know, evidence of why it's called Pitchford. So you'll see pitch, tar, Bitchman, whatever you okay, want to call it. Yes, I see. And they've used it to gap up the the timbers. Right. But I mean, I do think maybe at some point they they actually put the pitch on the timbers to waterproof it as well. But Pitchford is, you know, we've got a pitch well about 100 metres away from the hall, and it's very rare to have pitch naturally occurring through the ground. But Pitchford That's does amazing. have it. And guess what? It's right next to a Ford. Okay. So it's really straightforward once you know <laughs> yeah. that Pitchford has a, 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 a you know a, a pitch well or, or a tar I, well or whatever you call it, whatever you want to call I it. I didn't even know that existed. I thought people made it, you know, it didn't actually it wasn't a natural thing that happened, but you've actually got a well and it's it, still got pitch it, in it. it. It's still got pitch, and we'll we'll go and we'll go and see it. <laughs> um and I'll I'll dig a tiny bit out uh, okay. of pitch out. But it does, I mean it's ever since you know ever since as far as we're concerned roman times yeah you know it's been identified and over the uh, plenty of uh, there's plenty of uh, historical you know uh, points about the pitch at pitchford and some people call this um you know i've, I've seen pitchford be called a magpie house before because you know po potentially because of the pitch on the on the yeah. timbers. So today the timbers look kind of reddy brown, but you're saying at some point they may have been covered in black pitch, and so it would have been more a black and white kind of maybe what a typical. I, I mean, there's evidence of there's evidence of this red stain, which was originally, as we understand it, meant meant to be Bullock's blood, which was put on the timbers to waterproof them you know whether it did I, yeah. I don't know it's probably mixed with kind of grease or yeah. fat to waterproof and that that's why you see the 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 red on there there, there are plenty of areas where there's there's black obviously there's there's still big areas of the pitch actually you can see yeah. just just, <laughs> up, just up there but i mean the, the a man called andrew arrell who's an architect in shrewsbury did a did a research paper on what in tudor times uh, the half timbered houses of Shrewsbury were painted. It was everything. Okay. I mean, it was greens, it was blues, it was reds, it was, I mean, it, literally anything you had near you. And Bullock's blood would have been in, um, you know, that it wouldn't have been difficult to get hold of Bullock's blood. So that the red, the red staining is certainly meant to be, and we've done red staining recently, it's obviously not Bullock's blood, <laughs> but it's meant yeah. to represent that. And that, that's, you know, the redness of the timbers is actually quite important to us at, at Pitchford. It's not on every side of the hall. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, the, the magpie okay. thing is that, that it could have been black and white some time ago. So uh, in a moment, I'd love to get back to hearing more about the Otley family and why they came here and what they did. But before we do that, just on a macro level, I always like to understand what was the overall layout? You know, was it a courtyard house? Because at the moment we've got this, I think, as I've just said, this kind of U-shaped with the three ranges, very often in the Tudor period. Uh, that wasn't uncommon, but you often, more, perhaps more commonly, had a courtyard house with four ranges. So was there ever another um, range here, or has it always been this shape? Yeah, I mean, funny, funny enough, there was, there, was a, there was a courtyard, and it seems bizarre to us now that, you know, because it's such a beautiful lawn and it sets off the house so well, but actually there was a wall between these oh, two okay. wings and you can slightly see the kind of rise oh, in, in, in the ground. Yes, that's right. And you would have had a, a portico just here where you would have accessed the courtyard. But look, I, 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 I see Pitchford as an E and an F. And in Tudor times, it would have been closer to, to a, an E shape or a U shape. And then in 1680, they added a, a, another wing so they extended it essentially to an F. So right. if we were in a helicopter at, you know, in, in 2024, we would see an F, but hundreds of years ago, we'd seen an okay. E or an e, uh, U. And the clock tower really makes the shallow 
mm. E, uh, it projects a bit from the northern the northern range, and and that gives certainly me a, a, a sense of an E, albeit a very shallow E. And and the clock tower was added over the porch. When was when was that? So we, we think we think the clock tower was added in about 1620, and the garderobe tower, which is the other side uh, of the hall, which kind of drains into the into the stream, or would have drained into the stream. Um, was added about the same time, and right. this is, you know, I always, I mean, Tudors like we do, like adding. Of course, they you know, do. Yeah, you know, when they've got a little bit more money, they like yeah. add a cot tower or gutter rope tower. Yeah. That's that's exactly what they did. But yeah, we think it's about 1620s. family. Uh, where did they get their money from and why did they come here? They were the junior branch of a family from North Shropshire that, that lived in Otley Hall. Um, they lived ar around this area, Fr Frodsley, Pitchford, and in 1473 they bought the estate. And the, the estate had gone through the, the Pitchford family, it had gone through the Bishop of Coventry, the Bishop of St David's, and it eventually ends up with the Otley family in, in, as I said, 1473. And the man who actually builds the hall is a man called, uh, or, or who's the owner at the time of the estate, is a man called Adam Otley. And he asks a local carpenter, um, John Samford, to come and set up, and he leases him, him, him some land on the, on the Pitchford estate and asks him to come and build, you know, bring his carpenters and, and build the, the hall. Right. The Otley family seemed to get its wealth, and, and Pitchford, for me, seems to be a projection of, of that wealth. You know, it, it's mm. hard to miss uh, with the kind of the quite intricate timbering, mm. uh, half, half timbering. But they got their money from the wool trade. Right. And that was the kind of North Wales to Shropshire wool trade. And they actually had some land in Calais, where, where they, you know, traded that wool. So, you know, wool in those days was obviously very valuable, not anymore. Um, mm. And this, yeah, this is a projection of that wealth. It suddenly, you know, come to Otley family and they could do something with it. And they, they did something very splendid yeah. with it ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. I've just been immersed in the wool men of the Cotswolds. And so I'm very, very attuned at the moment to how much money was just involved in that trade. I mean, it was probably our premier industry in, during the period that you're talking about. So lots of money to be had uh, if you were involved in that business. Okay, so, so the first family, the first people to move in here were, what were their names? It, it was. It was. It would have been Adam, Adam. Otley, and, and and the family. And what what we think is that they took, you know, this kind of derelict great hall. Yes. Um, essentially restored it or refurnished it, and some, why we think this is, is that some of the timbers, and we think they're from about the twelve eighties, are still in the attic space, still in the roof okay. roof space. And lots of experts over the years have, have come and said that, you know, those are not you know, 1550s beams. Those are 1280, 1300 beams. So we, we think the West Wing was, was where the first work happened. Was it like a hall house, do you think? Did any of the, you know, just a simple hall with then at one end, the so, you know, the living arrangements and the solar and that that's what was here. And then I, the Tudor or, or the late medieval period, they came and built these I, other I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. right. And so, you know, we've got a date of 1549 on the West Wing. Yeah. Then where we think, we just think it evolves in terms of the Northern range, you know, probably a, over a kind of five or 10 year period. And then the east wing 
and why we think you know this evolution in a sense is captured in the in the half timbering because here we've got you know it's pretty straightforward close studying and then this side and we, let's say this is 20 or 30 years later you know we've got oh, lozenges yes. Yes. we've got chevrons we've got these barley twists and one feature that is so important for us at Pitchford is the little faces. And all the mm. way around, at the, uh, the bottom of the barley twists, you have these faces. Now, I always understood these as the faces of the carpenters that built this incredible building. And so in a sense, you know, we're hopefully looking at the faces of a 1550, 1560 carpenter with, you know, with their moustaches and, yeah. you know, potentially yeah. their hats. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're probably about 10 of these masks are around, you know, in, in the carpentry of the hall. the main entrance way was originally this way which is through the garden and and leads towards like a bank is that right or is it, is it, have I got it you're, you're funny enough you're very you're very close to where the carriages would have stopped to let out you know their their passengers and allow them to go in the hall so where this sundial sundial is now is where I think the carriages you know, would have would have would have stopped, and then they would have gone up into the stable yard. Uh -huh. The stable yard is brick, as you see it, but in those days it would have been half timbered, a, a, a you know, beautiful mm. Tudor uh, thing. The the actual entrance to Pitchford is through this piece of land, through the grounds, through the parkland, the, the original entrance. So may I just, dis or maybe you could just describe what we can see. And we'll take a photo of this, dear listeners, so you can see the view that we're discussing, because it's, it's beautiful. Maybe you could describe it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's classic English parkland with oak trees. Re I mean, you know, some of these oak trees must be, you know, 500, 600 years old. We've got uh, what we call the Roebrook. Um, coming just about 10, 15 metres uh, away from the house. There used to be a bridge here. Now, now it's just a weir. Right. But the carriages would have swept through the avenue, past those actually sycamore trees up there, then through the oak trees. And on this little rise, mm. and there, there was a bridge just here, mm. and the carriages would have come across the bridge, across the lawn, to the... To, you know, what is now the Sundar and, and just, you know, into, wow. into, into the hall. The Victorians built up, um, these are kind of retaining walls. So it, it's no longer quite, quite like that. The bridge is gone. The bridge was actually moved down, down there oh, by, the, right. by the Victorians. Oh, so that's the bridge uh, that was so over they, there. Is that, is that uh, exactly. Okay. You know what the Victorians are like. Oh, God, they, yeah, they did, yeah, they made their creation, their version of... It, 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 exactly. But yeah, that, 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 that's the entrance. Just, and, and, you know, the cows are... But you can see the roadway. You can see the flattened you ridge can. there still. Uh, I mean, when, when it gets, when it gets, if we're in a drought, you actually kind of almost see the, the kind of cart cart tracks, yeah, yeah. Uh, carriage tracks. Huh. Um, so, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. 
But this is an, uh, we should pause just right now because I know it's a beautiful summer's day, which really, really helps. Uh, it is, as you say, a, a quintessentially idyllic English scene, uh, landscape. Even, even the cows lying down in the field over there just add to the sort of, uh, the beauty <laughs> of the place. This, has a particular feel coming here. It is quite isolated, isn't it? It, it is very isolated. And, and the, the houses, uh, Country Life did an article about Pitchford three years ago, and they compared it with two other, you know, large Tudor houses. And they talked about Speak Hall you know, near, near Liverpool, and they talked about Little Morton Hall uh, in Cheshire. I'm obviously a little bit biased here. <laughs> They're both amazing houses, but Pitchford is in a much more tranquil setting in the in the, in the kind of midst of the Shropshire or in the folds of the Shropshire hills, the, the rolling kind of countryside here. Feels very, very rural, feels very tranquil, apart from the Derek. And, and uh, <laughs> De Derek, the brilliant Derek, who's, who's one of the heroes of Pitchford in terms of saving this place, Apart from the, the <laughs> mowing machine, it's normally silent yeah. here. And, yeah. and, you know, sadly for Speak, it's near an airport and Little Morton Hall is, is, you know, near an A road. So you don't quite have that tranquility mm -hmm. that, Steve. you know, maybe we would have had 400 years ago. So Pitchford just feels really settled in that incredibly rural kind of Shropshire mm -hmm. setting and, mm -hmm. and beautiful, just a just beauty of the parkland really. I could just put myself a chair here with a nice little gin and tonic and just I bet you, I bet you do that don't you <laughs> may have happened once or twice <laughs> now where do we need to go next James uh, we need to go up to the tree house really, okay let, let's go because uh, oh, the tree house now I've I've I have to say I've seen a couple of pictures and it's famous isn't it Pitchford and its tree house absolutely famous yeah it's it I I always say when we do the guided tours that it's a real gem um, for Shropshire actually because you know, it is the world's oldest tree house. It goes back to you know I, I think probably about 1670, 1680 but it could be it could be I mean I've, I've seen some experts say it, you know possibly 1630, 1640 and it, we think it's part of the kind of pleasure grounds uh -huh. of Pitchford. So rather than have one of those formal banqueting halls, which were often little pavilions sited on domes or little towers at the side of the garden, you've got a, a tree house. Yeah, it's, and it's in an elevated spot. I mean, Pitchford is in a way set in a, in a hollow, which is very protective in a way from, you know, the, the, the winds. And it's nice to be in a hollow in a, in a cold yes. kind of winter. <laughs> But the actual tree house is on the highest bit of land around the hall. So it gives you a really elevated position and a view, you know, of the Shropshire Hills um, oh, and particularly wow. the, long, the Long Mend. So we are walking uphill. You might be able to hear me huffing and puffing a little bit more into the microphone. Sorry about that, dear listeners. And we're just making our way up away from the house. Right. So yes, it's got to be pretty unique, a tree house to be built as a sort of a pleasure pavilion at the time. Do I we think know so. of any others? There, there was, um, <clears throat> there was obviously, there was obviously a bit of a craze in Shropshire at that time okay. for tree houses, and there was one in uh, near Ludlow. Uh -huh. And there was one in a place called Dot Hill, and neither of them exist anymore. So Pitchford really oh, is wow. the only one we've got left. And you, you can see it now. It's in this, it's in the kind of boughs of um, this broadleaf lime. How and old the is lime, the tree? yeah, the lime itself. And this is why I slightly date, date the tree house. Yeah. They think the lime tree was probably planted in about 15, 1500 or maybe 1550. Really? And then work out how, awesome. how long does a lime have to grow before it can hold, you uh, know, a, yeah. a tree house. Right. Uh, to, to, to this extent. And you'll see, I mean, it's absolutely an ancient tree. There's a hollowness there, but it's still, you know, every spring the leaves keep on coming, coming back. So hopefully yeah. it is apparently the, um, we, we think it's the oldest 
broadleaf lime in the British Isles. Really? Um, I think it's. I think I'm right in saying the treehouse is the only listed uh, listed treehouse. I think it's the only treehouse that appears on modern ordnance survey map, but and obviously it's the world's oldest yeah. treehouse. So it's got lots of this this you know this incredible tree and a tree house that it holds. Look at this tree. I love trees. Hello, tree. Well, I think it's important to hold them. I think kind of it is touch a tree them, and, and, and appreciate uh, the tree. Yeah, it, absolutely. Exactly. It has been here for. And it's obviously sort of put the big branches are supported by these pillars, which you'll see on the images. Chris is busy taking a few pictures of us, so you'll be able to, to see that. So can we go upstairs? Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, now, River, you're going to stay here. She'll probably start moaning, won't you? Bit of whimpering. So here we go. And, it, you know, it's done... The beauty of the treehouse is it's done in, you know, half-timbered style. Um, so so it's works very well with the, yeah. the hall. Let me just... Oh, my goodness me. Look at this. Oh, it's even got plaster ceiling. Is this plaster or carved wood? No, it's, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's plaster. And we think the plaster was... Probably the date for the plaster is about 1760s. Right. Um, it's, it's got these incredible windows yeah. as well that I just absolutely love the aren't shape of them. Aren't they beautiful? Very yeah. fragile, aren't they? they need, you... Everything needs a bit of restoration yeah. at, at Pitchford, so, and, and uh, the tree house certainly needs it. It was last restored in 1980 uh, by my, my mother-in-law. Right. Um, so it, it definitely needs some more restoration, but it's it's... You know, actually, to be, to be honest, it's it's considering it's in this really exposed position and gets all the weather from from across the Shropshire Hills and Wales. It's done pretty well. So uh, we're looking out, aren't we, across the fields to the hills in the distance, Shropshire Hills. Yep. I mean, really far-reaching views. I can just imagine this when it was first made and the family coming up here and being very proud of their new uh, treehouse and and pleasure folly. They, they think there may have been a deer park here ah, as well. That so makes you, know, sense. you could have been in this elevated position looking down at um, you know your 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 herd of herd of deer. Or maybe even I don't know, maybe even they hunted from up here, do you think? Yeah, it's possible, the ladies yeah. with crossbows? <laughs> yes. Because they yes. used to I certainly in the Tudor period they would drive the deer in front of a stand. It's so a, it, rather than having to get on your horse it's and a, chase... It's you, a really good point because the ha-ha is about, what, 10 or 15 metres away, so he's easy within, um, you know, a, a, a distance of a, a, an arrow yeah. from, from a bow or a crossbow. Yeah. So I, I think it's a really good thought. Yeah. How interesting. Fascinating. I love it. Do you ever have picnics up here? We do. We, we also use it for um, charity kind of tea parties and, and uh -huh. things like that. Uh, we and, and maybe we'll do a secret supper yeah. up here at some, uh, well, at, some hope, point. At the, at, end uh, of the, at the end of our chat, we should talk about, obviously, what you're doing in terms of events and um, how people can make the most of coming here. Could you hold? Could you rent this for a part for your own little birthday party or anything like that? Do you ever do that? Well, I, I just I, I love the idea of doing. We did in the orange tree. We did um, actually before it was restored. We did a pop up supper for three or four nights with a local forager. Uh -huh. Oh, lovely! Chef. Oh, lovely! Um, and uh, people actually really appreciated mm. that. They, they loved the they love the evening. And I, I, I've approached a few people about possibly doing kind of secret supper, a pop up supper in the in the in the tree house i think it'd be quite could be quite a special yeah evening. It, it'd be lovely because you've got this area around it as well which is also lovely so you can kind of spill out and yeah. uh and it, it, very quickly this is ah. the successor lime tree so one of the first things we did when we got back to pitchford in, in 2016 is to take a cutting from oh, the lime wow. so Maybe in 100 years, 150 years, the treehouse will oh, move to, to the, this lime. It's about, what, about a metre and a half at the moment? Yeah, about that. So that, that is hopefully the future of the Oh, that is lime. lovely. What a great idea. That's fantastic. From progeny from the, the progeny, original yeah. tree. It's, it, uh, you're absolutely right. That's just wonderful. Hmm. 
the countryside is just full of life going on at the moment, isn't it? With the grass being cut and harvested and You've got it's a idyllic English scene. You've got tractors, mowers and uh, cows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and a little, bit of, a little bit of breeze now. Yeah. yeah and, and then you, you see, yeah, from the treehouse, you can see the hall. So you've just got this beautiful view through the This is a lovely view, isn't it? It is, isn't it? And, and so, you know, the, the, the window of the treehouse does align particularly with the West Wing bedroom. Mm. And that was where, certainly in the last 100, 200 years, that would be the master bedroom for the, for the right. hall. Right. Uh, so that alignment, I think, is quite is quite important and, and, and interesting. Has Pitchard Hall ever been involved in filming for any period dramas or films? It has actually. There was there was um, about a year and a half ago. There was a film. It hasn't come out yet, but it, it won some awards last weekend at, at Cannes. Uh, so I'd hope I'd hope oh. to see that. It was it's a World War One okay. uh, drama, um, yeah. and the 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 lead uh, actor returns to a shuttered house after the war and, and Pitchford is your shuttered your shuttered uh, house and it's all under kind of dust sheets. And you could relate to that, right? We, we can relate to that because that's exactly the experience <laughs> yeah, we had in, yeah. in 2016 when, when we returned to the hall and we spent, you know, two months just cleaning up dust and, um, hmm. you know, getting the house in a better shape. Uh, 25 years, oh, yeah, 25 years worth of dust. That's, that's, but, that'd be quite a lot of dust to clear up. That's right. Okay, so that's the tree house. Now, you mentioned a pitch well. I've got to see this because I've never seen one before. So please lead the way. Yeah, it's about, it's about 500, <laughs> it's about 500, 600 metres. We'll just go past the church. Then we go down what I think was a Roman road. And that's why we think there was a connection between, you know, the Romans and the pitch. Uh -huh. we, we, we'll go past the church. They found a carving of what they think was Pluto in the church. So they, it was a quite interesting dynamic between the pitch well and the church. There was a sense that the pitch well was perhaps a slightly dark well. Uh-huh. And the church was is the kind light. of a the light and the they're bouncing up. So the dynamic between the pitch well that's just there and the church, which is on slightly elevated land above the pitch well, actually is quite, is quite interesting. And, and you... I'm sure the Tudors would have, and you know, medieval England would have picked up on dark pitch oozing up from the ground. Oh, yes. That's slightly scary. I would have thought so. And you believe this might be a Roman road simply because of some of the, the well, connections with the well, Pluto they're, they're, and so on in the yeah, church? Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're on some of the old ordnance survey maps from the, you know, say the 1890 
2 version, I think, it's marked as a Roman road. There's a Roman road that goes across the estate yeah. and from what, what used to be called, obviously, in Roman times, Viriconium, but it's now Roxeter. Uh. It's an English heritage site about five miles away. And the, the road that goes all the way down to Lentwardine um, goes, goes across the estate. So there's, there's lots of Roman activity hmm. around here. There's, there's the abutments of a Roman bridge still uh, on, the, uh, on the estate. Um, so we know there's plenty of... I mean, Viriconium was a huge, essentially kind of Roman city in, in uh, Roman Britain at that time. And that, yeah, it's a few miles away. So I didn't realise it was so close because it is, even though I'm a Tudor nut i actually would love to go and see rocks because it looks incredible as a site yeah and it's so it's so it's so it's so close yeah you know, it, re- it really is oh i see uh, something so that looks like a well yeah it's a shallow it's a shallow well and it's in this grove of um yew, yew trees and, and a few beech trees yes we're in the middle of woodland aren't we it's a really shady shady spot we are we and we're just by the you know, the, the bridge we saw as well which you know, so we've got the Ford here, we've got the you know, drive, the um, Oak Avenue, and then I'll just get down into the well. I mean, it really <laughs> okay. is. And, and people say to me, was it, was it deeper? Funnily enough, I don't think it was much deeper. Uh-huh. And I don't, think it, I don't think it needs to be that much deeper uh, because the pitch comes out. And I'm just going to get a little stick and I'll... So hopefully, yes, Chris is getting a picture of this moment. So. <laughs> ah, that's a bit. I can always tell because it's much harder than that. Oh, I see. Oh I'm not going to pick. Well, actually, I will pick it up. But okay, so <laughs> smell this and. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's the stuff you smell when they're putting new. Um... Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's pitch, it's tar bitumen whatever you want to call it and it just naturally occurs from here i mean you can see bit, bits of it bits of it here it's a big bit here that people have taken out on, on one of our guided tours but that just keeps on it just keeps on emerging from the from the ground so you know why wouldn't you use this a waterproof a timber a timber building or, or coracles there's a big coracle tradition uh, in this part of the country with kind of Armbridge coracles and Shrewsbury coracles and, you know, the pitch goes on the coracles to, to waterproof them. Wonderful. Well, that's, that's absolutely a first for me and certainly for Tudor Travel Guide followers. So, wow, I've learned something new. I, as I said to you before, James, I had no idea that pitch was naturally occurring. I thought it was something that workmen made up to put on. <laughs> to yeah, put it's on fine. I, mean, I, think, I think there are a few... <laughs> pitch wells in america i think there was one there was an article in the times a few years ago about uh the pitchford pitch well but one in italy as well as you get you get a really good view of the hall i was from, gonna say going from across the bridge. this bridge yeah and you can see some of the restoration we, we're just doing a section of the lime plaster on the uh on the east wing it's really stunning fantastic views you see on the right is a garda rope tower that i was talking about that little tower that that, that does look like that it's kind of almost out. exactly it's almost added well it was added on and um you know still the, the loos and the bathrooms are in that right. garda rope tower they don't drain into the uh the stream anymore but and, a, but and a lovely sort of bay window there that's quite an unusual feature is that added later or is it that is it is we think it's kind of late uh late late 1700s right. and you know when we go into the drawing room it really opens up the park and you get just a wonderful view from that from that from the uh you know drawing room it's a, a lovely oak panelled room but that that does enhance the view having that bow window i'm not i'm not sure all tudor purists love the the bow uh, the bow window <laughs> because it, it is a bit of a it does slightly interrupt that uh, yeah. the east wing but from you know actually living in the house it, it it does give you such a such a great view of the the countryside around us and, well, now and the bridge I, now i have an appetite to get inside and go exploring so can we go there next we can there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot to there's a lot to to see with um you know priest holes and uh oh, you know, all, all the kind of loads of rooms and the, the oak paneling etc etc and, and some of the tudor you know paintings as well mm-hmm. that i must uh, i must show you you have been 
listening to the first part of this month's episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. The remainder of this episode is only available to members of my membership site, The Ultimate Guide to Exploring Tudor England. To join the waitlist to become a member of The Ultimate Guide, click on the link in the description associated with this podcast. You will be added to the waiting list and I will email you just as soon as the doors to the membership next reopen. I'll see you there. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. If you've loved the show, please take a moment to subscribe, like and rate this podcast so that we can spread the Tudor love. Until next time, my friends, all that remains for me to say is happy time travelling. <laughs>